Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video, tackling one of our top 10 lists. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure that you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic looks at the top 10 questions skeptics ask with answers. Some Christians are afraid to engage with unbelievers because they don't think they'll have the answers. Of course, it's okay to say, I don't know the answer to that, but here's something I do know. But we're all supposed to be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, 1 Peter 3.15. Here we go with number one. How can God be loving with the world as it is, so full of suffering? That really is the number one question, uh, the most often asked question. Once in a blue moon, it's a philosophical question, but most of the time, it's actually a deeply personal question. And you can sometimes tell by the way they couch the sentence, like, uh, why would God let a little child die? there probably is a little child in the story. And so philosophical answers really aren't going to help. But there are six things that are good to come to mind when we assess this problem. Number one, God didn't make the world like this. When he made it, it was perfectly good and there was no death, no suffering, no funeral homes, no old folks homes. It was a wonderful world. That's good to remember. Secondly, that God wanted real people, real people who could make real choices, especially the choice to love. And that meant they also had the choice to not love. And sadly, that's what people did. Love takes a risk. When parents have children, there's no guarantee that the children will love them back, but they think it's worth the risk to try. And then number three, every sad thing in the world, including natural disasters, can be traced back to human sin. The world collapsed, and the Bible says the whole creation groans and travails, and it all tracks back to human rebellion against God. Then, of course, the great story that we have revealed in the New Testament is that God entered our world in human form, became the man of sorrows. He understood their sorrows in the Old Testament. He says to Israel in Egypt, I know your sorrows and I've come down to deliver you. But in a real way, he arrived on the planet and lots of people talk about trouble in the world. They talk about suffering. Nobody solves the problem. It's like the weather. Everybody talks about it. Nobody does anything about it. But Jesus said, I came to do something about it. And so, number five, God has found a way until he eradicates suffering, he's found a way to use suffering to our benefit. Now, football players say no pain, no gain. Ballerinas go through a lot of pain in order to do those little pirouettes. We understand this idea. We go to dentists and surgeons and chiropractors because we think sometimes a little pain is worth a great benefit. And God thinks that a few years of suffering on this earth is worth a lifetime of blessing. In fact, Paul says the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. So God has found a way, though he didn't cause the suffering, he's found a way to use it to the benefit of those who trust him. And the promise is all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. So if I love him, I will trust him. And if I trust him, I will ultimately see that these sufferings were turned to my good. As Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. He turned it to our benefit. And so the sixth point is this, that finally and ultimately God is going to make a new world where every tear will be wiped away and there will be no more suffering. The reason God is waiting now is he wants those who are still enemies of his to lay down their arms of resistance and come over to his side. And he's waiting patiently for that to happen. But someday he's going to say, gentlemen, it's closing time, and he's going to remake the whole world. And there will be no suffering anymore, but also it means there will be no sin. 
So I have to accept the guilt of my sin, receive Christ as my Savior, and when I do that, I'm brought over to the other side, and I will enjoy that world to come where suffering will be eradicated. Number two, what about God's judgments in the Old Testament? It's a wrong notion to think that the God of the Old Testament is different from the Jesus of the New. The God of the Old Testament, we're constantly being told, was a God of compassion, of patience, of long-suffering, of grace. Jonah said it. Lots of the Old Testament people who knew God in the Old Testament said that he was. And if we read carefully through the Old Testament, we discover that's true. Obviously, Genesis 1 to 12 is heavily edited. It's the same period of time from Genesis 1 to 12 as it is from 12 all the way through to Matthew. And so God is fast forwarding through this period and it can give us the impression that God was in a hurry to show his anger, but that's not true. He waited very patiently. The Canaanites are an example of this. He sent them Abraham. He sent them Melchizedek. He warned them through the judgment on Sodom and still they rebelled against God. So finally the judgment fell. But we should never forget that just as the exodus of the children of Israel out of Egypt coincided with the time for God to judge the Canaanites, so the rise of the Assyrian Empire led to God using them to judge the Israelites. And God used the rise of the Babylonian Empire to judge the people of Judah. So God doesn't have two sets of rules. And we recognize in the New Testament, the first time Jesus came, he came not to judge the world, but to save the world. But 2 Thessalonians 1 tells us that he's going to return in flaming fire. Jesus is in flaming fire, wreaking vengeance on all those that know not God and obey not the gospel. So God is a loving God, a patient God. He is slow to anger. He's ready to pardon, but ultimately he has to judge sin. And if people don't repent, the judgment falls. So God is God and he has the right to judge. And he's very patient in the process, but ultimately judgment will fall. That's why the cross is so important because God's judgment on us fell on his son. And if we accept his son, we stand where the fire has been and we have no fear of coming judgment. Question three comes at things from a little different angle. Hasn't science disproved the Bible? Well, it's interesting to me that most of the science, scientists who laid the foundation for modern science were God believers. Many of them were Christians. And they didn't find anything disproportionate or dysfunctional in thinking about God as a scientist. In fact, they said the reason they expected a creation of order with laws was that they saw the God who gave laws in the moral universe in the Bible. And so they expected that kind of a world. Today, many leading scientists are Christians as well. So it's not inconsistent one view with the other. Science has a long trail of disproved theories. In fact, that's what scientists do. They put up trial balloons and expect them to get shot down. And so to put your faith in science, when science is constantly in a state of flux, my mother's science text, none of it would be taken seriously today. So don't pin your hopes on science. Rather, God has revealed his truth, absolute truth, which we can lay claim to. Science doesn't even promise to answer the most important questions. The questions that little children ask, like why? They don't know why. Only the Bible can reveal why God created the universe. And so we shouldn't read too much into the Bible. Some people think, well, the Bible says that God created the world in 4004 BC. Well, it doesn't say that. God doesn't spend a lot of time talking about his schedule. When we read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we see that the universe had a beginning. Scientists until the 1960s thought it didn't. But then with background radiation, they discovered, oops, it sounds a lot like Genesis 1. And it tells us that there was information transfer. The world is not material. 
The world is at its base information, and information is not material. And so to be a materialist and try to explain everything by the chemistry and the physics is to miss the point that behind the chemistry and physics there is a code, and the code is information, and information always comes from intelligence. When we see the order of creation, the universe, the, the space, and matter, and water, and sea animals, and land animals, and man, that's exactly the order the evolutionist says the geological order explains. So God is right. Did Moses just guess this 1500 BC? No, this was a revelation from God. We also learn that man is made from pre-existing material. You know, some of the atheistic cosmologists think they're clever to say, it's not Jesus who died for you, it's the stars who died for you. You're made from dying stardust. Well, maybe they haven't read the Bible lately, but the Bible tells us we were made from dust. And so the Bible is not inconsistent with a scientific worldview. If it's not science falsely so-called, the theories of men, for example, that life comes from non-life, that purpose comes from purposelessness, that design comes from an undesigned universe. These are figments of man's imagination. And the Bible tells us that when people reject God, pretty soon they start believing in fables. And these are fables. You know, when I grew up, I was taught that a frog turning into a prince, that was a fable. But I went to school and found out it was science. Well, it's not science. And we need to make that careful distinction. Number four, isn't the Bible full of contradictions? How can thinkers take it seriously? Well, I won't say too much about that, but there are good books available that deal with a lot of these apparent contradictions. There have been no actual contradictions found in the Bible. Now, there may be some copyist errors in various manuscripts, but thankfully, because we have so many thousands of manuscripts available, we can compare them and find out which ones made the error. So today they will tell us that 99.7% of the scripture we're absolutely sure of, and the places where there may be a little question, there's no doctrine that hangs on those passages. So we have a thoroughly dependable manuscript here, and of course we're thankful to our Muslim friends because they were the ones who discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls which were manuscripts written before the time of Christ, hidden away near the Dead Sea at Qumran. And when they were unrolled, we discovered that the scroll of Isaiah, as it was written back then, is identical with the scroll of Isaiah as we have it today. There isn't one significant change. And so the God who supernaturally gave his book also supernaturally preserved his book. And so it's important for us to believe what God says and when we have concerns, to take them to him. And he's quite happy to reveal the answers to our questions. And I think if people were more honest in their search, the promise is that you will find me if you seek for me with all your heart. Number five, why hasn't God given more evidence of himself so we have to believe? <laughs> because God's a perfect gentleman. And if he gave us overwhelming evidence, like there's as much evidence as for the sun, everybody would be forced to believe. And God wants people to have a real choice. So he's given us sufficient evidence, but not overwhelming evidence. He wants us to search for him. He wants us to seek him. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And as I just quoted, you will find me if you seek for me with all your heart. So there is considerable evidence, sufficient evidence, Romans chapter 1 says that people actually know there's a God. It's just that they don't want to acknowledge him as God in their lives. And number six, why are there so many denominations? Right? If we can't figure it out, what hope is there? Well, we shouldn't confuse true Christianity with all the brands of religion. It's a bit like a ship in the sea that gets barnacles, and after a while it's hard to tell what's the ship and what's the barnacles. And the way to discover that is to go back to the source. And in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul lists out seven things that every believer accepts. This is the faith once delivered to the saints. 
And this is what true Christianity is. I love the story of Harry Arnside, who was out preaching in Oakland, California, and a man said to him, hey, mister, how do you expect us to figure out the right way when there are so many different religions in the world? And Harry Arnside said, so many religions, sir, I only know of two beliefs in the world. Two? He said, there's Islam and Judaism and Buddhism and all the isms of Christianity. What are you talking about? And Harry Arnside said, sir, there are only two beliefs. There are those who believe they can save themselves and those who believe they need a savior. And all the other beliefs in the world are a do-it-yourself proposition. Only the Christian message says there's one way to be saved. So the fundamentals are agreed upon by every true believer. The Bible is a complicated book. I mean, if physics and chemistry are complicated and they're just some of God's toys, when we get into the Bible that tells us about God, we're going to have a little disagreement. But those are superficial compared to the essential message of the Bible, which is agreed upon by every true believer. Number seven, are the followers of all other religions damned to hell? This is really good news. God loves Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus and atheists and everybody else, and Christ died for them all. There's nothing small about the offer of the gospel. The question is, how seriously will people seek after him? He can be found if we seek after him. So a person who grew up in a culture where they were only taught one religion, and by the way, your belief should not be based on your geography. If you're born in Saudi Arabia, you have to believe a certain way. No, God wants us to believe the truth, whatever that truth is, and to seek for the truth with all our hearts. And if we do, he says we'll find it. So a person who would be an honest seeker, though they have grown up in another religion, they'll come to the point where they realize my religion is a hoax. It doesn't give me joy and peace in believing. And so they seek after the Lord, and if they seek after him, he will manifest himself to them. That's his promise. So every person who is not trusting in the true God has no hope because there's only one way of salvation. They don't have to know all the details of the cross to be saved. None of us understands how the cross works. Only God does. But they have to put their trust in God. They have to have faith in the true God. And if they transfer their trust to him, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now the Bible tells us that the Spirit has gone into the world to convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And Jesus said, this is the light that lightens everyone who comes into the world. So it's not that people have not received revelation from God. The natural creation clearly, says Romans 1, clearly reveals the true God. So people have to turn from their false religion and embrace the true God. And if they do, God will save them. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Another common question, number eight, wasn't Jesus just an enlightened man, like the Buddha or Confucius? In order to be a Christian, you don't have to believe that everything is bad about every other religion. Obviously, there are good things in every religion or people wouldn't follow them. But it's a bit like rat poison. You know, rat poison is 98% good. It's just the 2% that kills you. And the Christian believes that where Christianity fundamentally disagrees with the other religions that Christianity is right. Otherwise, you wouldn't be a Christian. So there may be many things in common, like the golden rule, that are in all religions. But the question is, what is fundamentally different about the Christian message? And when we look at Christ, we see, first of all, that he claimed and then proved to be God incarnate. Buddha and Confucius never did such things. Secondly, he died atoningly. He gave his life as a ransom to save us from our sins. No other world religious leader did that. And then finally, he was raised bodily from the dead. You can go to these men's graves and you can see where they lie. Not Jesus. He is risen. He is not here, as he said. And so we have this glorious truth that Christ is risen. And not only so, but he's coming back. Even the Muslims know that Jesus is returning. And so while 
these religions may have admirable points, the fundamental issues relative to Christ are unique to the message of the gospel. Number nine, how do you know there's something after death? This is a common argument. Well, you know, nobody's been there and come back to tell us about it. And that's a glib statement, and they just haven't done their homework. Because when we look through the Bible, we see that Isaiah went to heaven and came back and told us about it. Ezekiel went to heaven. Zechariah went to heaven, came and told us about it. In the New Testament, Paul went to heaven and came back and told us about it. John went to heaven and wrote a whole book about it called The Revelation. And Jesus lived in heaven, and he came and told us about it. So you can say they're all liars if you wish, which is pretty tough to prove because the Bible is the most vociferous champion of being truthful and telling the truth. And God says, if a prophet of mine says one word that isn't true, take him out and stone him to death because I want you to have absolute confidence in what I say. And so the majority of the world believes in an afterlife. They just don't know where they're going. But the person who opens the Bible discovers heaven and hell, the wonderful land that waits us in paradise, and the horrible judgment in a place called the lake of fire, clearly described in scripture. And Jesus himself spoke about these places more than anyone else. And so we have clear evidence in the Bible that this is true. And then finally, number 10, why did Jesus have to die? Couldn't God just forgive us like we forgive? Well, that sounds like a good idea, but there's a difference between personal offenses and the judicial obligation of a judge. You can imagine a judge and a friend of his shows up at a trial and the friend has murdered somebody. And the judge says, hey, you know, we're buddies, so yeah, you can just go. Say, wait a minute, you're not just a friend, you're the judge. You have been entrusted with the execution of the law of the land. And so, yes, God forgives his people based on the finished work of Christ. But there has to be payment made. When the books are opened, we will find out that God hasn't cooked the books. He hasn't fudged to let us sneak in the back door of heaven. You can look at the records, and on my record, there will be many sins that have been expunged. They've been cleared of the record because somebody else, my substitute, has paid for those sins. So there's a difference, a, a sin against man and a sin against God. I'm a sinner too, and so of course I should forgive you because I need to be forgiven. But God doesn't need forgiveness. And sins against God are acts of insurrection, of rebellion against the government of the universe. And these are very serious, and God takes them seriously. Finally, the curse of a broken law needs to be dealt with. The consequences of death need to be dealt with. I may forgive you, but for example, if you hit my little girl and killed her, even though I forgive you, you can't bring the child back from the grave. But God can. And somehow this God of recompense is going to straighten out everything. I don't know how he's going to do it. But there's no justice in our court system. If somebody kills another person, they can't give the child back. They can't give your loved one back. But God is able to do these things. And so God someday is going to straighten out the whole mess and that's going to be a wonderful day when God recompenses, reconciles, restores, repays, and sets the whole record straight. And that's why God asked his son if he was willing to pay the price. So God himself someday could make a new world where sin is completely eradicated and all the damage that sin has done has been restored. And at last, we'll step into that new world where righteousness will dwell, will be at home, and everybody in that world will like how God thinks, and they will be righteous too by the grace and mercy of God.